Good morning. Thanks for getting up early and uh, coming here to uh, hear us talk about uh, navigating the transition from uh, some of the old apps that have been around for a long time to uh, some uh, new and hopefully improved uh, applications. Uh, we're discussing this a bit amongst ourselves when we were planning, and I think one possible subtitle for this session could be no pain, no gain, because I think for a lot of you who have been using these old apps, uh, it's potentially quite painful to uh, upgrade and move your users over to these new applications. But hopefully there will also be some uh, uh, good things coming out of that with new features, uh, better stability, and more modern technology that we can support for uh, many years to come. Uh, so as you hopefully already know, there are several of these core apps that are being um, transitioned now, so to speak. Um, in particular, uh, the data entry apps. So both the tracker capture app uh, is being uh, deprecated. Also, eventually the data entry app uh, will be replaced with a new version. And we sort of already uh, also started with uh, event reports where uh, part of the functionality is now available in the new line listing app. Uh, and I think what this makes this particularly challenging is that uh, especially the data entry apps are probably the apps where most users spend most of the time in DHS. Um, so lots of users and they're doing a lot of the work uh, in those apps. So the idea with this session is to just raise awareness that this change is, uh, change is coming, um, already started, I think. I'm not sure actually if we have like a specific version where the, the aggregate data entry app will be uh, removed, the old one, but at least for tracker capture, that will be uh, no longer be supported after 41. Um, so it's something that is coming uh, in not too long. So we want to just highlight that people need to start planning for how to m m make these changes. We'll also go through each of these apps and um, talk about what the key changes are. Uh, and finally, we have been working on some uh, uh, material to help you sort of uh, move your users, your implementation from the old apps to the new apps, which we've been calling uh, transition toolkits. Uh, so we'll present those and we'll ask you for uh, feedback to see if this is something that you think will be useful to help you with this uh, this change. Uh, yeah, so as I said, I think because these are so, um, so widely used, these applications by end users, uh, thinking of how you will communicate this and planning training um, will be important. Um, so I think from our side, what we're suggesting is to make sure that if you haven't started trying out these new apps with your implementation, your configuration, uh, it's very useful to do that now, even if you're not planning to make the change until uh, uh, maybe in a year or two, just to make sure that things working and to get an idea of how big the change will be um, in your case, because I think it depends a lot from uh, configuration, implementation, to implementation, uh, how challenging this uh, might be. Uh, I think it's also already now important to think if you're doing like big trainings of end users, uh, to think of whether you should include something on these new applications in those trainings, even if you're not ready to sort of fully move to the capture app from tracker capture, for example. Maybe you can um, maybe you can include them um, in the training programs just to make make people aware that this is coming and give them a quick um, introduction and to plan early how you're going to train this because I think in some some cases maybe you've been using capture already for events for a long time and this change to using capture also for tracker is not a big uh, big thing in other cases. You might have hundreds of users who have only ever seen tracker capture. And then it might require uh, training. You might 
need to uh, think of how you're going to fund those trainings, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, the plan here now, uh, as I said, we'll talk about these translation kits. That's the first thing on the agenda uh, after an introduction. Then we'll go through um, tracker to capture uh, translation, um, including hearing from Ghana, uh, how they've been uh, managing this so far. Then we'll look at the data entry uh, for aggregate, some implementation considerations, uh, and finishing with a Mentimeter and discussion. So with that, I'll hand over to Shurajit to uh, talk about the transition kits. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks, Olaf. All right, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the tools that we're trying to create to support this transitioning, more on the implementation side of things and in terms of guidance, materials, etc. cetera. Um, we do have something for event reports to line listings, so I will focus on that as a, a use case as we discuss this a little bit more, and then um, we'll hear from the others on some of the other applications as well. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, just a quick comparison here. Um, so what are these transition kits that we're working on? So the idea with these kits is to kind of have a bundled set of resources that are kind of working together that complement each other to kind of really explain um, these new features, um, these new apps, and kind of how they will replace the previous applications. So we're kind of doing a line-by-line -line comparison in terms of previous features that were in the previous apps and how that is then implemented and how it works um, in the new apps. There's a bunch of implementation guidance, results from testing. So um, also, for example, in the case of things like custom forms um, and other types of tools, um, you know, how that actually um, kind of what, what appears when you kind of move from an old version to a new version um, within these apps, um, as well as links to training material to help support uh, that transition as well. Um, there's also some communication material around these as well, more like promotional material, just to make people aware um, of this. Um, and we're we're trying to finalize that promotional material, but uh, the rest is at least available for event reports to line listing. So uh, I'll go over an example in a moment. Uh, I'm just going to cover some of the concepts that we wanted to cover when we're working with these, and we'd like to hear some feedback from you later on um, to see if we're in the right direction. So in addition to event reports to line listing, which I'll cover, we have a number of other transition kits planned. So. One is not an app necessarily. Well, we have the WHO data quality tool that is an app, but then moving this to the core data quality features. We're not going to talk about that too much today, but that is another consideration. And then, of course, the other ones that you will hear about, tracker capture to capture, the current data entry to the new data entry, and maintenance to the current maintenance to the new maintenance app. And some of these will be delivered in phases um, as these uh, new features are released. So the basic uh, premise of, of these transition kits, they're, they're similar, you know, in terms of gathering resources and making them available for you to guide you um, how to implement this transition in practice. But there are kind of specific areas, of course, for each application that might have a little bit more detail. So on the data entry apps, for example, there might be a little bit more, for example, on custom forms, which wouldn't be um, involved so much in the other types of kits. Oh yeah, there are shared el elements, however, like uh, managing the continuous release cycle, which is something we're trying to communicate more clearly um, as well as part of this process. So um, we tried to make a couple different uh, uh, considerations around building these kits and, and I'll open it up in a moment so I can show you. Um, but uh, as an example for event reports to line listing, um, the whole idea was to kind of make this as smooth as possible, understanding that in some cases, you might have people who are quite familiar with using event reports. Um, in other cases, you might have those who have not really used it. And in that case, just introducing line listing as a, a new tool or an existing tool for them uh, might not be as uh, have much of an impact on their daily workflow. Um, another area we looked at is uh, some of the changes in these uh, different versions of the, the apps as well. And, and I'll discuss that in a moment um, in terms of how that affects uh, how people work with these applications. So we wanted to kind of make sure that uh, we could show people how to replicate what was existing in event reports. Um, we also wanted to show people, of course, the new features that are also available. So things like more detailed analysis on repeated stages, for example, that is not supported in the event reports app. There are a number of other features as well, um, but the idea was to both show what's existing as well as add some supplementary information um, on this material, or on these apps, sorry. Um, we, we also wanted to kind of demonstrate the general workflow 
Um, so in the event reports app, um, we've we've had for some time focusing on this sequencing of what, where, and when, and actually in a lot of our training have focused um, on this. Um, but uh, in event reports, actually, sorry, in line listing, um, things are selected a little bit differently. Um, the order of operations in terms of selecting your inputs are grouped a little bit differently. Um, so there might be some changes there for some users who are kind of, um, uh, you know, familiar with that previous process. Um, and in this case, this unique case, we have event reports. And as Olaf mentioned, it's not quite fully replaced by line listing. So these apps actually have to work together um, where you're maybe creating aggregate pivot tables um, in event reports and creating your list course in the line listing app. So you do have some kind of, uh, um, you wanna make sure that you can introduce these in a workflow such that people can use both of these apps still. So you're not necessarily um, replacing the previous event report app, um, but you are making all your line lists in the line listing app. Okay, so. Okay, so this is an example of a guide we've made. It's available on our documentation page. Um, and this kind of goes through some of the various steps in moving from event reports to line listing. Um, there's a number of different things, you know, all those different considerations that I spoke about um, are available here. Probably the most useful thing for people will just be the link um, that's in the presentation, as you can then review this yourself. Um, but, you know, you can see here we've tried to kind of get into quite a bit of detail on all the various features that are available. So there's a number of videos and demos um, looking at all the features, and there is comparisons here um, between event reports and line listing. Um, we also have kind of a detailed list of features basically comparing and trying to quickly identify um, where these things are and what's supported and what's not um, in, in these uh, uh, two apps here. So just comparing line listing and event reports with one another. And then there's a whole bunch of information on uh, moving your old um, event reports over to the line listing app and what are the implications um, of that. They are supported of course in the new app, but there are some things to consider um, when you're moving those old uh, line lists over from event reports to line listing. Um, and then just uh, how to kind of work together with the event reports app as well. As I mentioned, that uh, should not be uh, removed entirely. Um, and then, of course, just a bunch of information on this continuous release cycle and how to manage the app, user permissions associated with the app. So there's a lot of information on just kind of managing this um, over time. There's information on testing and updating the app. I'm looking at changes over time. So here you can see the screen here and then the screen here. So there, the inputs have changed quite a bit in terms of where programs are selected, et cetera. Um, this has changed again in this latest release as well um, with the track density type um, available. And then just how to review features and how to update the app, et cetera. So uh, there's also training materials, a link to training materials, a training package um, at the bottom. So the whole idea behind this is to provide you with some tools to kind of you know plan your movement from the previous app to the new one. And that's what we're planning with the other ones that I've uh, discussed as well. Um, within these within this framework. Okay. Um, just real quickly, um, we're not going to spend too much time on this today as well, but we're also planning something for, I'll just go over data quality and, and tracker capture to, to capture real quick um, to give you a preview. So uh, we're also looking at this for the other apps as well. So just to give you a picture um, for data quality, for example, we have the previous WHO data quality app. Um, and we're moving to the core feature set um, in DHIS2. So we're actually describing for each type of visualization um, within the WHO data quality app, how do you move that over to the core, for example? And we have a lot of guidance on setting this up already. So it's more just describing um, what are the kind of um, equivalent of types of visual visualizations and tools that can be used um, within this uh, uh, the core feature set. So for each kit, it's kind of a little bit different just based upon the app itself and, and what its function um, was and, and how we are handling it now. Um, tracker capture to capture, just real quickly. So this is probably a, a, a large one for, for many people, depending on, as Olav mentioned, there might be people familiar with capture, there might be people not so familiar with capture, but they're also you, you also might have this scenario where of course they're not really using tracker capture right now. And then of course introducing capture is a, a bit different in that scenario. So we're trying to account for these different scenarios um, when making this kit. But uh, what we've understood is that there's an entirely inter a new interface that's being introduced for, for many of the core actions. So things like searching, registering a person, enrolling a person in more than one program, 
Um, this all looks different than the previous app. So while there could be people with a lot of familiarity, and this might not be so tough for them to kind of ingest and apply in their own work practices, um, you can also have uh, you know, others who might need a little bit more support um, in order to move, uh, carry this forward. And then of course, this, uh, this one has some specifics on custom forms as well um, that need to be considered. Uh, yeah. yeah, so just real quickly, for example, this is uh, moving from enrolling a person in multiple programs. Um, you can see it looks a little bit different. So just to account for these different types of operations and changes. So in the kit, we'll kind of have similar to event reports to line listing, just a list of the different types of operations that are performed and how they're performed in tracker capture versus how they're performed in capture. And then there'll be some videos and other explanatory material um, that will help to guide people um, through this change um, and through this process. So yeah, that was just a bit on what we're planning. And we have that event reports to line listing um, transition kit as a, as a framework for this. Um, and we're happy to get a bit more feedback on this uh, towards uh, the end of the session here. So yeah, I'll hand it over to Marcus. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks, uh, Shurjit. Um, I'm going to cover some um, specifics on the tracker capture to capture, or tracker to capture. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, these four things. Um, and not so much about the how, but I will be covering what, why, and when uh, we will take this pain slash gain. Um, and uh, I will leave mostly the how to the Ghanaians, but I have some specifics to bring there as well. Um, the um, Oswald from Ghana is gonna is gonna show us how they have done it in Ghana. Um, we will also have some support on the how from um, the transition kit that Shurdit is developing. Um, so that's why I'm gonna focus mostly on the three first. So what do we transition? Well, this is. Uh, to the left is the old track capture, and to the right is the new capture. This is the app transition. And as you might remember, we used to have two different apps for for um, capturing single events and capturing tracker data. Um, they are now both in the same interface, and and we transition we um, uh, retired the event capture um, a few years ago, uh, and um, the some of your users might uh, already know this app. And uh, if they do, then we hope the transition is going to be easier. But this is, uh, th we know there's also a lot of users who really love this user interface. Um, we, uh, we hope that this is going to be the new place where everything will converge. We are now doing the same uh, workflow in the header as the other apps. Um, the apps looks the same. And, and um, we hope that this will converge uh, once your user transitions. We, we, will, we hope that we will have a much more unified user interface throughout uh, uh, the solution. Um, we are also transitioning the backend, the API. Um, and um, I want to mention this because um, at the same time uh, as we are switching the app, uh, we are also changing all the endpoints. Um, this, is, uh, this is from the documentation. Um, and one thing I will say here is that if you are, if you have your own scripts, your own apps, and so on, you should, you should know this, and you should uh, consider switching to the new endpoints. If you start a new project, hopefully the uh, documentation will guide you to use the new endpoints. Uh, now, two forty one is the last version where we are planning to release the old app and the old endpoint. So the plan for two forty two is that they will no longer be there. So please. Um, Please have a look at the documentation. So why, why are we taking on this? Uh, why are we re-implementing the app? You might ask. I did cover some of it. We want, but we want to align the technology stack um, because it was built on a different technology that no no other apps in DHS2 in the DHS2 framework were built on. Uh, it was not sustainable. Uh, we couldn't have some people who knew a completely different technology than all the rest. It would be very hard to keep. Um, 
uh, uh, developing uh, efficiently if, if this was the case. So we had to align the tech stack. Another thing is that things that are now developed by the core, by other apps will, will benefit the capture app and, and vice versa. So one example of this is the calendar where we are now, um, we know that the calendars aren't, aren't good enough um, anywhere really in DHS and we, um, we are making a new calendar component that will um, be inserted in all the apps now, in, in the front-end apps. Uh, that will be much better and cover all the different use cases of entering a birth date from the 1969 or entering tomorrow or entering yesterday. So uh, this is something we can do because we have now aligned the tech stack all, all ar around the platform. Um, the UX alignment I also commented on. We want all the apps to look and feel the same. Why did we re implement the endpoint though? Uh, and by the way, th there is a new endpoint, but all the data end ends up in the same place, obviously. So if you have, you can do a partial transition of your endpoint. You can do some calls through the old one, some through the new one, some through the old app, some through the new app. They all end up in the same place. But we did re-implement all the code that leads down into the database. And this is primarily because we want to improve the performance and we want to scale much further than we ever could with the old um, old code um, and um, uh, we also are very uh, very focused on making sure the code is maintainable uh, meaning that um, it's easy to build on and, and um, find bugs and uh, and understand generally for both the app and uh, the endpoint we have made sure we have a much cleaner architecture than we did before and the main reason for this is velocity we want to be able to fix things faster we want to be able to build features faster and with more security that we don't break anything, that we don't make bugs or, or um, have, un have unintended consequences when we change something. Uh, we also make sure the code is much easier to read if anyone is making contributions. This is very, very important. And um, with the old apps and all the endpoints, a big barrier to con contributing was that the code was so complicated. So, so we didn't... Um, uh, it was very hard to contribute. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, why? Um, why are you transitioning? We think that Capture is now supporting your use case, and, and we are using the word feature parity sometimes. Um, and um, this is also the reason why we're saying 241 is the last time we are bunch bundling tracker capture. And what you need to check is whether this is true. When you install on your, in, in, in your country, there might be something that is missing or something that is not working exactly like before, and there might be a new way of doing it, or, um, or there might also be uh, some small holes. We know that the print functionality is, is one thing that we have not implemented as it was in the old tracker capture. The main reason for this is that print when we started investigating the requirements for the print, what we found is that what people really want is to print something that is formatted in a certain way. They don't want to print the form necessarily. There might be a few people who want to, but they can do print. They can do the browser print. So this is why we didn't build the print as it was before. And we hope this still will cover your use case, but we need you to check. We have also built um, a framework or we're building an example plugin for uh, building your own print that's customly um, that's that is um, customly formatted, which we hope is much closer to what you need. So this is why collapsible sections we just haven't gotten to yet. So this is one small thing, um, and then JavaScript in custom forms. And uh, there there is, seems to be a rumor that custom forms doesn't work <laughs> in the new app, and that's not true. This is a screenshot from last night from the from the new app. Um, I just made a clumsy custom form in the child program uh, uh, to, to make sure, also show to, for me that the rumor is not true. You can make custom forms, but you can't, you can't assign values between the fields anymore. But anyways, this is not something you should have. I mean, this is, there is a reason why you can't. The old custom forms was a security nightmare and uh, every pen test, we got the same thing. This is not good enough, you can't allow people to upload their own JavaScript that manipulates the form. This is an obvious attack vector. You can't do that. So, so this is the main reason you can't. Um, the, 
uh, if you had JavaScript that was doing very advanced things here that no longer work, we hope that the answer is always going to be uh, one of two things. Either you can do this with program rules or you can do this with a plugin. You can write a proper plugin that has a sandbox and runs in, in a safe way um, that we plug in instead of this field and that does whatever you did, like make a lookup to a server or, or whatever. So this is this is the message uh, for <laughs> for anyone that has a custom form. But we are really eager to see custom forms being migrated and get in touch with you if um, if you have any problems or questions on, on, on any of this, on the plugin framework or, or any of that. How many have tracker custom forms in the in the room? Oh no, just one. <laughs> I know that guy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So why why to take the pain? Well, we are no longer adding new feature in, features in the tracker capture app. We're only adding them to capture. This is because we're not that we don't want to waste any money. We want to uh, make sure that um, that uh, we are thinking about the future and that you are thinking about the future. The the new features, well, with maybe one exception, uh, the last two years have only been added in the new app. Um, there are already some things that is better in the new app than in the old one. We think we have multi select. Option sets. Many people want that. Um, we have related stages, which is a great new feature. We um, uh, had unfortunately a, a hiccup on the what's a new session, uh, but related stages is is um, a new type of relationship that is between two stages inside your enrollment, and you can make sure there is a proper link between the lab request and the lab response, or the birth and the uh, and the and the child follow up, and so on. Um, inside one enrollment, so we are really excited for this uh, this feature, and it also covers. This is what we call. Um, this is the feature that will cover um, the um, uh, referrals um, when uh, when you're when you are referring for lab, for example. Uh, we have much better working list support than before, uh, especially the tracker program stage working lists. We think will solve many of the use cases where you want to make uh, a working list based on some uh, lab data or some visit data inside a tracker program, the program stage working list is something to check out. Uh, and uh, relationships are much more configurable than before. We can schedule with program rules. Well, we can assign the next schedule date with program rules. Uh, oops, yeah. And then we had a short demo. I don't know if uh, we are going to do that now or if we have time for it. Maybe not. No, OK. Uh, well, when um, when do we transition? When when do we take the pain? Slash, when do we get the gain? If you are in 38 or above, you can already start because um, you can download the latest uh, app uh, and run it on your 38 and start playing around with it. If nothing else, if you're running an instance and you're not, not ready to transition yet, just start the capture app and check how everything looks and let us know. If if it's not um, if there is something you see that you are not sure about, for example, um, you should start now if you if your server is on thirty eight or above, and you have to do it before forty one end of service end of life, because this is the last time we are bundling the tracker capture app, and of course forty one is still gonna be in support a few more years, um, but um, uh, but we we really want you to to think critically about um, when to upgrade and don't let it slip beyond this point. Um, a short uh, short comment on the how before I let the Ghanaians show an example or uh, speak from their experience. Um, the um, what, what you have to do is to essentially update the app to the latest version. This is done in the app management app. And there's a one of the core apps is the capture app, and as you can see, this app has an update available. So this is a clue that you should probably upgrade. The capture app is released um, very often. Uh, whenever we have a bug fix, we put it right out, so you get it right away. Which is also good if you reported something and and we um, and we fixed it for you, you will get the fix right away if it's in the app. 
uh, this is how the person history looks. And as you can see, we have two releases on June 6, another one on June 8. This is all uh, bugs and, and features going directly out to you guys. Um, if you have any trouble, this is the label that we are watching uh, closer than any other label. Capture adoption. If you uh, if you want to sneak in a bug fix on something else, you should try putting this label just to see if it works. But uh, we are re we re really want to help you guys uh, and uh, use this label capture adoption. Um, we want the first adopters to succeed, and then um, when we have uh, um, uh, at some point the um, the the yeah the. Um, Right now, we don't have many bugs on on uh, or features on this label, um, and we are watching this intently. Use this if you find anything, or reach out directly. You are in a special you are in a special queue when you are adopting the capture app. In, in my in my uh, world, um, small mention on the opt in opt out. You may might have seen this on the user interface below or over your working list. If you see it, it's probably because you have logged in with the super user, which you shouldn't do. You know that. Uh, but um, the the ones who get this one is um, the, the, they actually have an authority called app management. I think that's wh why you get it. Um, if you log in with super user, you will have the app management uh, a role, and you will see this. But this is um, this is an option that we have kept around. Um, the default is now that you will use the capture app for everything, but you can opt out and say that okay, for this program, I want the users that click on uh, on anything in the working list to come go to the old tracker capture app still. So this is a way of doing a phased rollout, but. Um, uh, but uh, it will soon disappear as well. All right, then I'll give it to the Ghanaians. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Oswald, and I work with the Ghana Health Service. So uh, my few slides would uh, center around how we have managed to move uh, our data capture from tracker capture onto the capture app. Of course, uh, the catch weight is moving with the current. Uh, it's always a risk to move with the current, right? Because you are moving at a time where the tides are very high. But uh, I think we've uh, gotten ourselves to that stage where we are able to adapt quickly. So uh, as far back as 2019, we deployed a uh, tracker for HIV and TB. And uh, that deployment was strictly web. We didn't do Android deployment for Tracker for HIV and TB. And so uh, for the past uh, six years, end users have been very familiar using the Tracker Capture app. And so there is that relationship between our end users and the old uh, Tracker Capture app. But that is a, a critical thing that we needed to consider as we uh, try to transition. What were some of the challenges we had uh, with the tracker capture? While it was working very well for us, there were also a few things that uh, end users identified anytime they were using it that uh, we, some could be fixed, others were just because of how the design looked. And one of them, of course, was the issue of the widgets. Even though sometimes you are able to try to centrally save default layouts for uh, and users, but they still had the opportunity to close widgets anyway. And so people close widgets and then they go search uh, an entity and then they do not have a widget to capture follow up data. Then they start calling system administrators. My data I cannot find a client to enter all that in those. And so it was one of the uh, key things that uh, was worrying us. And then of course, uh, closing of uh, enrollments completing enrollments instead of uh, just completing the events and all that. Then there was this thing that keep occurring, duplicate events. So there is one event on a data entry app, and then for some reason or not, it is duplicated on the system. You clear a uh, catch and nothing shows up, and it's just there worrying us. And it was also 
something that uh, was a problem. Then the bigger one for HIV was a uh, custom working list because uh, we're not using the tracker just as uh, an MAE tool, but also a tool that the data offices and the ART clinicians were using for daily management of clients when they come for the ART center. So they needed to be able to create custom lists that allow them to manage smaller groups of uh, and uh, use uh, clients when they come to the clinic and all that. And so uh, when the uh, capture became available for tracker uh, programs, it became necessary because of course, there were some new features that came there that were of need to us. And then uh, particularly we had issues with regarding the scheduling. One of the problems that we had in the early days of our tracker program had to do with our inability to automatically schedule clients using the default due date. And it then mean that we had to come out with a very complicated algorithm to get our clients guarantee on treatment. But if at the time, if we could automatically schedule clients, then we could use that to have a simpler algorithm for guarantee on treatment. And probably at that program indicator would have performed better than us. So, there were very key reasons and key features that came with Tracker Capture that uh, we thought it was necessary and it was a good bargain to use that to do our transitioning. Then for timing, I think uh, for strategic reasons, last year when we deployed, uh, when the 4.0 was released, it came with features that we had been accessible for for a very long time. And uh, it also came at a stage where we wanted to change how we do our upgrades and to sort of stay as close as practicable with the core releases. And also because the strategy was now that we will have a core release at least once a year. And so the changes were not going to be drastic. So we wanted to stay at least just a year older and be sure that we are catching up on all that. And so we made sure that last year, all our instances were running on 4.0. And then there was also a transition at the program level where they were moving from the old tracker programs that we had set up onto a full surveillance model for HIV. And so it also put, uh, gave us an opportunity to introduce something new on the system side so that it is uh, both transitioning the content and then the platform itself uh, at the same time. So in the preparations as we also did some reviews of our programs, of course, because there are some of the old program rules that if you needed to review them, to be able to get them to work uh, efficiently on the capture app. And so we did all those things. And then we had to also engage the managers, the program officers to be sure that uh, they are in agreement and they are aligned with the decision to move on to the new capture app. We did that and then we also developed some new uh, workflows using the capture instead of the tracker capture to do that. And one key thing that we also tried to highlight was the new capabilities uh, hitting on some of the complaints that users gave us in the past that it was now possible to do them on the capture app because they were now fixed. And that was also a bargaining point for them to do. So we carried out some trainings uh, across the country and uh, during those trainings, we made sure that we uh, pointed out the day-to-day uh, -day tasks that they were carrying out before and how they could do it on the capture app. And so it made it easier for them to find where they can perform their regular daily tasks. And that point, when it comes to transition plan, what we had decided is that one of the things uh, we did was to make sure that all the apps are still available. And then for the next six months, they have the ability and the option to use either of them. And then they try to do their own comparisons as they use them. But the plan going forward is that by the end of the year, we all then do a full uh, transition and takeoff tracker capture, even before official takeoff uh, from the core uh, product. Then for new instances, we are doing only capture app going forward. And that is something. Uh, what were the some of the lessons? Uh, piloting is always okay. In Ghana, we hardly pilot. 
But when it comes to uh, the capture apps, what we did was to first of all, make it available to the district health information officers who have uh, some administrative roles and supervisory roles across the country for them to first get familiar with the platform and then they become support points for uh, the data capture officers when uh, they are capturing data and they had problems. And also we set up communication channels. We had a dedicated WhatsApp group to interface directly with the data officers so that they are able to report immediately what they cannot find or how to perform a particular task that they are very familiar with. And it is always important to start early. It comes with these challenges because the bugs may be up there, but it's always important to test it out and get familiar with it even before you have that official plan for transitioning. And then of course, to ensure that your training materials are practicable and localized according to your, and uh, reconfigure to your local needs and things uh, will look a bit more better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you picked up on so many of my points that uh, you'd think we had spoken together, but I assure you, I have never seen I have never seen this man before. <laughs> uh, no, we we thought we'd ha have a few. We have a few minutes for some questions for the capture app and for the Ghana team. If if there would if there is anyone who, who has any questions right now, we can we can take a few minutes. Do the closest one first. I think I saw. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Just a quick question for you. I think your point about starting early is is well understood, and I'm wondering how your team is approaching starting early testing and then managing the continuous release process and what your plan or process might be for that. Okay. So for especially for HIV, what we've done is that there are quite a number of data officers that uh, have become like uh, uh, ambassadors for Tracker in Ghana. And so uh, when we have new updates, we have a staging server that is almost a replica of our production with every data that they use and their user accounts, everything is in there. The only difference is that you can enter dummy data there. And so whenever we need to do anything new, we push those ambassadors onto that staging instance to go try out their hands. And there are people who can actually reach out to you at midnight and tell you that I tried to do this, I tried to do that. And then it gives us an opportunity to build our strategy around them. And then also because they have become ambassadors of Tracker, a lot of their colleagues in other regions are very comfortable actually consulting them for help anytime they have a problem instead of trying to reach out to national system administrators or district system administrators where there is no that personal relationships and all that. So we try to use them a lot more to do those transitions. Thank you. <clears throat> So about two years ago, the design team did like a list of all the different reasons why people use custom forms. So we have like a pretty well-documented, you know, list of reasons, right? I'm just wondering, when can we expect a, a list, a repository of examples for plugins that would match those needs for custom forms? Because if we have that list, it's going to ease the transition a lot because we already know why they use the custom forms for more or less. So yeah, what do you think? I think that's a great idea. Um, the first plugins are being built, and I think it's just so we we have to be alert now and make sure we collect them and make them examples for others to use. Hmm. Oh, great idea. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, oh, there we go. A question I have for you is: c Could you talk about maybe some of the pain points, particularly? from a UI UX experience for your users, maybe some of the things that, that um, you heard a, a lot of transitioning um, to, the, to the, new, the new app. Yes, so from the 
U.S. point of view, the key one, of course, uh, that comes to mind is the location of your org unit. Everything is now up there instead of on the left side, which they've been used to for the past six years. So it was one of the things that we needed to communicate and communicate very well. And then, of course, uh, if you look at the interface of the capture now, it's a bit more flat. And so if you haven't configured uh, custom icons for each program stage, on a first glance, you might not be able to differentiate between your program stages and sections. And so there's something that I think if we can improve on that uh, from the core, it will help the user experience uh, a lot more better. And then uh, uh, one of the questions that was asked uh, when we first showed them the interface was, where can I do a referral? Because these are HIV clients who move around a lot in the country. And so data officers do a lot of transfers to their colleagues. So the first day we opened the interface, the first question was, where can I do my referrals? All right. And then we had to show them where it is. And you would see that the enrollment data is a bit more hidden at the moment. And so probably you can do some configurations. I do know that it's now available in the latest release of the Capture app that you can move the enrollment data a bit more up the screen so that it's a lot more visible to the end users. And, and just to add a little on the issue of plugins, I think one of the things we have tried in Ghana to do is to try to stay simple. And it has helped our upgrade processes. We do not do a lot of custom stuff on our instances. As much as possible, we try to implement the things using the core features that are on the system. And so upgrades are a bit more smoother when you do not have too many custom uh, stuff on your instances. We have time for one more question. Thank you. Uh... Nice presentation. I just want to know uh, how do you manage your trainings again in the capture app? First you were using the tracker capture. Now you are using the capture app. So how do you manage the trainings and what are the feedback from your users now they are using the capture app? Thank you. Thank you. So for the training, what we did was that uh, because it was also combined with the introduction of a new program model, the training was in three sessions. So the first session was, of course, introducing the new workflow of the new HIV program. And then we showed them a workflow of how it looks currently on the tracker capture and then how it looks on the capture. And then the third part was to do a hands-on. And during the hands-on, we did not do the hands-on on the tracker capture. We did the capture. And wherever there was a question about how to perform a particular task, then we use an opportunity to tell you, okay, this is how you used to do it in the tracker capture. This is how you can do it on the capture. And then it sticks on. So a lot of the hands-on were done using the capture. Thank you. All right. Thanks, uh, Oswald. Okay, is this on? Okay, thanks. Morning, everyone. I'm David. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the new data entry app, or the has been around for a while data entry app. But before we get to that, we're talking about transition, talking about changing. Um, and so as we are transitioning to using a lot of AI, a lot of people have been using ChatGPT for their help with their presentations. And as we were putting this together, I thought, let's, let's see how ChatGPT is doing with jokes now. So we came up with this. Uh, we thought we'd ask ChatGPT, how many hisps does it take to change a light bulb? We're talking about change, we're talking about transitions. And um, it was actually pretty good. We were, we were quite surprised. So how many hisps does it take to change a light bulb? Just one, but it requires a multi-sectoral workshop, extensive stakeholder engagement, robust m and &E framework, and a comprehensive rollout plan to ensure sustainable illumination. I mean, I don't think I, I tried to come up with a better one myself and I didn't. So I was like, all right. So. <laughs> So yeah, just before we uh, give everything to ChatGPT to do, 
we still have to enter data ourselves. This is probably the last thing we'll be getting the robots to do for us. So anyway, so aggregate data entry, good old um, old fashioned app. It's been around for a while. We've had the beta um, available for a couple of years now. I think 2022 was when it was released uh, and it has had this beta tag. I would like to say that in 41, the beta tag is being removed. It'll now be the data entry app and the old one will be the legacy app. Exactly how the names get managed over versions. We'll need to do a little bit of um, a, a bit of updating on. But I won't spend too much on the why. I think um, Mark has covered a lot with the why of the transitioning um, to capture. And it's, it's almost the same. You can see the same UI. It's a better tech stack. It's more maintainable. Um, it's easier to use things across um, apps and also from, from web to Android. So that's one of the main things is a lot more easy to use um, between to keep things similar between um, the platforms. It's mostly the same. Most of the things are there. I've also heard the rumor that people think that custom forms don't work in the new data entry app. They do, um, with the exception that Marcus also brought up is that the, the JavaScript was a security risk. It's not supported anymore. But we've had a look at a lot of people's custom forms and most of them tend to not use JavaScript. So if there if there was a reason that they're using um, JavaScript, please let us know. But But most of the time, if you've got a custom HTML form, you can still use it. Um, but one of the things we are, which, I, which I'll go into a little bit, is, is looking at the reasons people were using custom forms and trying to remove them. So custom forms are great to give users a, a, the, a look that they're used to from maybe from paper forms or maybe what they want, but they are a pain to maintain. They're difficult to make. They're hard to make changes to. You're relying on, on developers to do it. So I'll have a look at some of the features that we're introducing in the new data entry app to make those um, changes, uh, to be able to configure the forms to customize the, the UX without actually having to build a whole custom form. So when will the data entry app be um, removed? So this is, this is the same as the capture. So at the end of life 41 is the last time that, that you'll be able to use the existing data entry app and then the new one will be, we, will be there. Uh, but they're both available now. So similar to that, to, to similar message, um, get onto the new data entry app, start using it, start testing out your, your forms, see what works uh, and start training people. Okay, so I, I, this is, I introduced this in the what's new session, but I didn't, didn't have a chance to demo it. So I wanted to just show you how we're adding these new configuration options um, to customize the forms without fully customizing the forms. So with any luck, I'll be able to find the screen I was using before. But maybe not, sorry. So let me open up the new data entry form. And what are we doing? Malaria. So as you can see, you've got the form rendering here and you've got the columns and rows as they are by default. But if we go, so this is one of the exceptions where we've got the old maintenance app, we're up making some updates. Um, but when we do release the new maintenance app, there will be a, a lot more um, functionality around this. But if we go to just the manage section, so this is the standard manage, se manage sections that you're used to, we have now added some options so that you can pivot the categories to the rows um, and the data elements as columns. So for that section, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add that. I'll do it for this one. as well and why not one more just to make it obvious and so i've just saved those changes in the maintenance app and come back to data entry and refresh the form and you can see that it's changed the orientation straight away so for what you used to have to go and make a custom html for i can now do in a few clicks um, there's also other options of, of moving if you've got multiple category options you can choose to move one 
Uh, so there's a lot more you can play around with on on how to do that. And again, these these configurations now can be picked up by the mobile app. Um, and so you can push those changes straight through again without having to customize again. And then the other thing that we've added in 41 that's available that we'll build on is, is text. So here before this section, I can say, make sure to count everyone or other maybe useful information that you might want to put as a note. And again, refresh and that text comes comes straight up. So again, something that we'd maybe have to use a custom form, um, it comes straight up. We are adding, <laughs> thank you. So so this is this is all been based on the, what Enzo mentioned, the design um, team did a lot of uh, research about why people were using custom forms, what were the most common things, and adding a little bit of the text and pivoting um, the columns and rows were the two most common reasons for using custom forms. So we attacked those first. Uh, the things that are coming next that should be available, both of this this app and the and the maintenance app are on continuous release. So before forty two, we will be adding more formatting. So at the moment you can add text, but soon you'll be able to add rich text colors, um, you know, better fonts, things like that. Uh, and we'll also be able to to style the the forms themselves. So if you want to have a red banner and a blue banner and and things like that, we'll do that. And then after that, we'll be adding rules. So more complicated. Um, uh, logic so that you can add some skip logic and things like that. So that'll be coming. So the idea is while we will support some custom forms, we want to remove the need to make custom forms in the first place. It should be faster and easier to, to, to create a data entry form that's usable and, and fully featured. So hopefully you'll be able to in, in the near future um, in this app, you'll be able to create a configuration custom form without having to create a custom one. Um, that's all I had. I don't know if we're doing questions for this part or, um, later. Okay. Perfect. So I'll put you back to the slides. No, it wasn't that one. It was this one. Sorry. And hand over back to Shujit. All right, so with all of these changes coming, we thought we'd try to share some guidance on just brief plans in terms of how you can implement this in the field. Now, of course, I think what Hiskana presented is a good framework in terms of a real world experience. We have a couple of points to add maybe to supplement that as well. So of, of course, I think as you've all realized at this point in time, um, you know, introducing this is much more than just understanding the features that are available. There's a lot of kind of extra steps that might need to be taken in order to make this work effectively um, in your own settings. Um, ideally, there's kind of buy-in from stakeholders that are kind of using these apps and tools, um, and they are made aware of these changes, so they're not kind of introduced in a surprising manner or in a manner that kind of catches people off guard. Um, there also might be other considerations, things like a budget that you might need to introduce, for example, if you're running um, a lot of trainings. Of course, there are different ways to manage this, and we'll discuss this as well. So. Uh, we have kind of a number of steps and it continues on the next slide as well, um, just to kind of help people to walk through how to understand these features, how to then in, uh, introduce these features as well. So uh, yeah, first step is kind of understanding these new features for each of these apps and tools and how to use them and also explaining them to other stakeholders to get buy-in to make sure that, you know, everyone's aware of what's going to happen. Um, I think th another part of this is understanding any of the legacy features that exist in any of the existing apps. And if you need to kind of manage these working together for some time, or if you're kind of able to move your entire workflow over into that new app, at least initially. Over time, of course, you'll be moving everything over, but uh, there could be something like, for example, event reports and line listing. You might need to use them together. Maybe you want to learn about the new maintenance app, but it's in preview. So you're able to use some of that to get used to it, but you're still using some other parts of the maintenance app to configure other parts as well. Um, becoming familiar with the continuous release cycle um, and how these uh, how this affects how these new apps are managed. So this is a process that I think you know uh, we'll have to introduce over time. Some of you are probably familiar with this process, but it's something that we want to introduce and have some guidance in terms of setting this up. Um, many of these apps also introduce things like new user permissions, for example. So you might have existing user roles, um, you might have existing user groups, you might have all kinds of other things that are set up related to access. 
um, and you might want to just make sure you manage that accordingly. And I'll walk through each of these in a moment as well. Um, another thing is performing testing, and I'll discuss a specific example, actually, in terms of why I suggest some testing is done, even though it's very easy to manage. You know, click on the update button in uh, the App Hub. Um, there are some other considerations here um, as well. Um, developing a plan to sensitize these users to these apps uh, via training and other types of communications, right? Doesn't always have to be training. Um, outlining costs associated with the transition. So the cost could be minimal, right? Could just be a series of online events or you're just sharing material. It could be more involved where you have some in-person meetings and things like that um, to perform this training. Um, implementing the training and evaluating the training as well. So let's just walk through a couple of these. So in terms of understanding the new features, the first place that we typically point people to is the release notes, right? For each version um, of DHIS2. Now, of course, there are, you know, Marcus showed that screen and there are releases uh, a bit more frequently, of course, than the big release. So there will be other documentation available to kind of explain, well, what's changed, what bugs have been fixed, et cetera, um, that can be referred to for those kind of um, uh, other releases that are uh, also there. But for the kind of bigger releases and understanding the features and getting a sense of how these apps work, in, partic in particular at this point in time, um, the release notes is probably the, the best place to look at first. Um, there's also the DHIS2 demos, right? So we have the play demo, we have some other demos available, uh, and you can then check to see what's new for yourself before you implement this on your system. Um, as part of the transition kits, we're also going to be outlining all these different features that are available, um, also within our DHIS2 Academy programs. Um, and of course, you can ask us on the community of practice if there are any questions. So we're going to try and have a couple different avenues for people to explore this. And the other thing is you could just install it on a development system of your own choosing if you're on 41, for example, and try to see what it looks like and how it reflects your own workflows. Okay, um, understanding legacy features. So I think this is also a kind of critical component just to see how things work together. So for example, if you want to kind of start sens sensitizing people to the new maintenance app, it could be a good time, right? Rather than throw everything at them at once, you know, there's a preview available now and you could start looking at it. But there are some functions that they won't be able to perform. So they might need to do that in the old maintenance app um, as well. In the case of event reports and line listing, all of the aggregate data that you're looking at, if you want to make a pivot table of some kind, you still need to use event reports, right? You should not get rid of that from your workflow. Whereas any line lists you make, so any individual lists of any kind, you know, those should be made in line lists probably going ahead, right? So just making sure to understand how these complement each other, how they can work together, and how your material, et cetera, and how your kind of communication around that um, works. So, so there is a little bit of kind of understanding to, to understand how these things complement one another. Um, the continuous release cycle. All right, so, so Marcus uh, kind of discussed this and showed kind of all these releases. But just understanding this as a concept, I think, is important. And not just for yourself, as well as you know, others who are involved in supporting your implementation. Um, some of these also introduce these. Uh, so this is for the line listing app. Uh, this is a, a new app authority. So for example, if you have user roles for analysis people in your system, then you might have to make sure that this authority is added to that role, or they will log in and they won't be able to access the app at all. So there might be some changes, for example, if you have SOPs, et cetera related to this that you would want to outline. And in particular for this continuous release, we definitely recommend that some type of SOP is outlined. Um, that is not kind of done in an ad hoc manner. Um, and, and I'll discuss this more in, in a moment here, but uh, it's very easy to kind of install these on your system as well as update these on your system. Um, but then there should be some other procedures kind of around this um, more widely speaking, just to kind of navigate the changes that are introduced as a result of this continuous release process. So this is an example here, um, why I recommend some testing. So this is the line listing app. There's a couple different versions and we see some changes in the interface. And ideally you don't want to introduce those without actually testing them and communicating those with users. So here we have up top here, this is the inputs bar and you don't select your program. And then here you have the inputs bar and you select your program and stage in the same section. And now we have this new tracked entity piece that's just been released recently. So you don't want these things just like popping up when people log into the app and then they're not familiar with what they are or how the workflow works. And then they kind of get a little surprised and are not able to kind of do what they would normally. Um, and then you might receive a lot of kind of subsequent requests from the field. So my suggestion is just if you have a development instance of some kind, 
just install it there first. Now, this might have minimal impact on your users, and you are probably in the best place to evaluate that. But uh, if there are some other changes, maybe you need to also create some new training material, for example, to explain to people, well, what does enrollment mean now? What does trapped entity mean now? How do I select the stages, and how does that affect my, my line list? And there could be others, of course, for the other apps as well, right? Um, so there could be new features introduced over time, and that might not coincide with your like full DHIS2 upgrade. And in that case, you want to make sure you still have some communication around this if you're planning to move to that new version of that app. Okay. So yes, it's very easy to update the apps, but just keep this in mind um, when doing so. Okay, on the training materials side, um, I think uh, you know you, you all have some idea of what might be needed. And what we're going to try and do, like I said, as part of the transition kits, we're developing training packages. That could be a good place to start. Probably you'll need to localize it, um, as the Ghana team mentioned. Um, for your own context, you might need to build kind of very specific tools to fit your own use cases, in particular for all these data entry processes, right? You might have very specific data sets, very specific programs with very specific people and workflows that you might need to apply this. Um, but as a starting point, we'll try to provide um, as much training material as we can to help you um, with this process. And we'll have a mix of materials. So we have a mix of videos, kind of guides for the trainer, guides for the participant um, sitting in on the training. And you know those can be done online, in person, whatever kind of works for you um, in, in your own settings. Um, but just building materials and, and think also a little bit in terms of when they go back, what can you provide them with? Um, so, you know, maybe you do a little training online or introduce something to them. You can, of course, do things like record your sessions, et cetera, but try to develop kind of small guides for them afterwards because maybe they forget something or uh, maybe they're not as familiar. Um, but I'll also think about moving away from like these large manuals um, that can be, you know, let's say introduce a 50 page manual or something that can be quite challenging for people to utilize on a routine basis. So just put a little thought into kind of how you will build this and what features you're going to have people focus on in particular. So um, in our case, we might have a lot of generic materials, but that will introduce a full gamut of things. You might want to focus on specific things that are local for your own implementation. Um, okay, o on the budgeting side, um, so once you've kind of gone through this process and figured out, well, what am I actually going to do? How am I going to introduce this? What type of materials will I use? How, what will be the modality of delivery um, for all of this? Um, you know, you might want to consider how much this will cost um, and, you know, Marcus outlined some plans in terms of, you know, which version you're on and, and how you should think about that. Same thing here, right? As you're going through this whole process, you should consider, well, how much does it cost? Um, because maybe you have the money already and that's fine because it could be minimal. Uh, maybe it costs a little more than you think, especially if you're planning a lot of in-person events, right? In-person training is expensive. You got to pay for everyone to come into one place or you have to travel all over the place um, to do this. And uh, that can be difficult. However, there are some things that are, you know, just, that just, just translate better um, in person. And, and you are also best placed, perhaps, um, to make that consideration. Um, another thing is maybe to consider piggybacking on existing events. So if you have like an annual meeting of some kind, like for a program that you're working on, let's say you have a TB meeting or an HIV meeting, and they have a tracker program of some kind, it might be a good idea to start sensitizing them at these types of events, um, rather than kind of having to build your own kind of training program and find money to support that in your country. Of course, that can be done, but uh, just in case there are any existing events for the latter half of this year, for example, um, you might want to consider how you can piggyback on that um, to help deliver some of this and sensitize people, even if it's not the full thing where you're not kind of saying, okay, we're moving over entirely, but it might be good to introduce these concepts to people um, during that time frame. Uh, and then support in the field. So once again, Hiskana mentioned this as well. Um, but some type of structured support to support these users um, should be put in place um, when you're introducing all these apps. Um, you know, in this case, that they also ran some of these legacy apps in parallel um, as well. But then how do you respond? I think it'll be quite frustrating for people if they're trying to do something, let's say, in the new capture app. They're not quite sure how to do it. And then, you know, they don't have anyone to talk to. And if the, especially if the previous tracker capture app is disabled or not accessible, um, you know, then they're kind of really stuck. And, and in cases where, you know, if you have, you know, some locations with real-time data entry, people might not receive their vaccination or their service, um, you know, that, that could result in some difficulty. So ideally, you would decentralize the support, and that would be done through all your training and sensitization and communication um, on this uh, topics. Okay, so I'll hand it over to Kim and Carolina.
All right. You can hear me? Let's see. Let's do everyone's favorite activity, a Mentimeter, also to warm you up a bit for the, um, the feedback session later today, so you can give good feedback there as well. Um, so this should be on, wait, I guess we're not logged in. No, I think it's fine. Can someone try and try and do it? It should be on survey mode, so you can kind of go ahead and and go on to the next question, etc. So if someone can try and make sure it works. Good. <clears throat> so since it's on survey mode, you can kind of move ahead on your own pace. And since we're, you know, cl getting close to the end of the session, I'll kind of just move on. Uh, through the questions pretty quickly. I guess if anyone has any burning questions or comments to any of the questions, Kim can run around with the <laughs> with the microphone. Um, so the code should be on all the slides. Uh, so we'll kind of just get started on the on the questions. So we just wanted to kind of gauge, you know, with whether you'd started with any of these three main app transitions that we were mentioned in the session. So kind of just to see. So yeah, we see at least people have started. That's great because line listing has been there since since 238. Someone has completed it as well. It's great. As uh Surdit has mentioned, you know, there is still still some things in in uh, event reports for for pivot tables, etc. So that's maybe why people feel like they haven't fully completed it. All right. And then we have legacy to new. A lot of potential here, so that's that's great. And then let's look. Oh, two have completed. That's interesting. Is it the two Ghana people? <laughs> would be interesting if it's not the two Ghana people and also the ones that have started. We would love to to hear more from you. All right. So we wanted to kind of just hear a little bit about you know the most the specific topics in capture that you know people would like to to have the transition material on uh you know the capture app is is quite big and and a lot has changed so we just wanted to see which one we should focus on in the beginning you know it'll be kind of materials will come in in phases so looks like it, uh, kim kim you have to talk in there <laughs> Uh, with the capture transition kit, uh, do you have a time frame of when we could expect some materials? You have to run over there and give them. <laughs> yeah, so we're we're planning some uh, actual um, this what's new in DHIS two kind of material um, around September, the end of September. So we're planning to have a lot of these available um, by then, hopefully. So that's kind of our tentative timeline mid to end September for, for most of the ones that we've listed um, in this document. Thanks. Yeah, we see that the kind of the navigation changes and the custom form form plugins is, is the, the popular one. So this is really good for us to, to guide, you know, which one we should start with first. Yeah, and then we added other, if there were any other topics. So program rules, can we change the color, emoji support, <laughs> example plugins, yeah. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. We just wanted to see if there were anyone who had started, you know, had anything they wanted to wanted to raise. Um, but yeah, seems like most don't know yet. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. And again, use the label capture adoption in Jira to to make sure we we see it. All right. And then we again wanted to get a little bit of a gauge on the custom forms. So it looks like most are not uh, have custom uh, don't have custom forms. Someone d does have one, and one have has with JavaScript. So, but they haven't gotten to. Maybe I've been moving too fast, but they haven't gotten to this point of what it's used for yet. So, uh, this can be again filled in on your own pace. So, we'll just move on to the next one. All right, here we have a few more that are using custom forms, both without and with the JavaScript. Okay, I haven't gotten to any responses yet. Um, 
Yeah. <clears throat> and then we wanted to, again, just see how familiar people are with this continuous re release cycle, you know, knowing that you can update continuously, you can use them on previous versions, et cetera. So we just wanted to, again, kind of see what the familiarity was in this room. So seems like, you know, most are familiar, but maybe need a bit more info. So then we also wanted to, again, see what, what kind of materials would be best. You can choose more than one. So it seems like, again, mo most of it would be would be very helpful. And we're glad to see that webinars will also be relevant. So that's also good to know. So we wanted to ask, I didn't want to call it, say that what aspects do you think will be easy? I said more uncomplicated. <laughs> so, um, well, someone is saying more that they would like clear description of, of changes and new features to understand the difference, which uh, as Sergit has mentioned, this is something that will be a central part of the transition toolkit. And then, yeah, we wanted to also hear a bit more about the difficult and the things that would be bearish, so we can again address those in the in the transition kit. So, of course, bugs and features that work in old app are not new. Money budgeting we get, and yeah, the plugins and actually having people to to you know work on those. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, any other feedback? We'll keep this one open. And then, I don't know what time it is. We have, yeah, I want to leave some more time for questions. So keep filling this out. And then, yeah, if there's any more questions, we can we can run around a bit. Oh, well, Eirik, you, you can run too. Who is excited? I'm excited now. <laughs> I'm ready to transition. Yeah, it's not much of a question, it's more of a comment. Uh, I see that there are a lot of things regarding plugins in uh, in the Mentimeter here, and I just wanted to say that in the next session, I was lucky enough to get 10 minutes to talk about plugins. I won't go into very much detail, but it's a high overview, and you get to, uh, to know a little bit more about it. Yeah, that was the... Developer... Just from DHS2 developers. DHS2 developers, yeah. Oh. You would never know. No other. Yeah. Jim. Um, thank you for all this information. I think for me, the two pieces are how should we think about the Android releases and how they fit into the application releases that we just went through? And then I think the continuous release cycle is still something that I would appreciate more information on. I think there's a difference between bugs and new features and how to track that, what constitutes having a kind of larger ping to the community about new features when they're released versus needing to monitor day to day whether or not the capture app was released three times that week and like how to process and like set our teams up our small system teams for like staying on top of that and understanding how to work that into our typical cycles. I think that is a piece that's exciting, but a little daunting. And like when we have an upgrade process that lasts for six plus months, how are you supposed to figure out which app is the app version that you're going to actually move forward with for that upgrade process? And like, at some point you got to call it, but like, it's it it's a overwhelming question, I think, that we would really love to have more guidance on. Yeah, maybe the last thing first. We are also trying to figure this out. Um, and um, maybe I hope the answer is going to be that you will always take the latest one. Um, but um, of course you will have to test on one version and stay on that uh, until you do your next round of tests but um, but always do the latest one I, I hope um, it's going to be the answer uh, we are trying to build uh, 
features and um, well uh, we, we, we are mainly thinking that you should be able to upgrade without anything like changing that you didn't expect so that if something changes it would be also based on some config change we don't know if that's completely doable but that's sort of our thinking right now uh, we also know that the daily release or like release every time we do something doesn't work very well from some perspectives it's very nice if you need something right away but the problem is uh, well one of the problems is that we don't really have a very good way of showing you what new features you would be getting if you install this version so this is something we're grappling with now and there seems to be at least two options uh, that is like at our doorstep one of them is release um every three weeks and have a list of all everything in the in the release notes it would make it much more manageable for you when you're upgrading just like check three uh versions and see what's there or uh, build a better um, app management app where you would actually roll up and list all the changes that you would get if you install the latest one probably two yeah. But yeah, this is something we're figuring out. I'm happy to talk more in the whole. So for the Android part, could you clarify a little bit the question? I think was because there are things like like change like change the changing it from. For our teams, if you are not. If you want to. I'm just wondering how we can support process if that's Yeah. Yeah, so just I guess didn't hear that online. Just basically about the recent Okay, okay. Just recent UI changes in Android and that transition as well. So we try to keep the documentation updated and the release notes. Yeah, we don't have the kind of toolkit maybe that, that we have with web. So yeah, I think it's a work we need to discuss about it and, and of course to do it in Android as well. Um, yeah, I think we mentioned it this in the first session. So we have two major releases per year. We try not to change the UI uh, within the same year. But but sometimes it's because of the needs. Um, but yeah, I think with working with the more documentation and these guidelines could could be more helpful. Thank you. One last question. Yeah, so uh, it's it's mainly a comment rather than a question, and it's mainly on the uh, we're trying to transition to uh, testing the new data entry app. So one of the things that came up uh, on the first click when we get to the screen was choosing the data set instead of the org units, the normal way. And we have about uh, two three hundred data set, and like the list just dropped, and everybody will say that is a no go because you can't find the data set that you need. Uh, and it was very easy for people first to click on the org unit, then to get the set of data set that they were using. And now they have to think of the data set uh, before even they get to the point. So it was almost impossible for them to know which data set to click for them to be able to start entering data. So I think it would be having a feature like to either switch on the data set, then you go to org unit, and also you can click back and get uh, much easier. Yes, that's we've heard that feedback already so that's that's good feedback and I think the design team we have talked about it I'm not sure if we've got some designs to try 
yeah i think we've thought of a couple of things like search in data sets and then yeah we're not even sure why it's kind of locked to data set and then organ it we want to open it up so you could either way decide which one to to select first so i think those are we're aware of it and those are a couple of improvements we want to make very soon and also if it's the testing with a super user where you have access to every single data set you see everything whereas i guess most data entry people don't have access to all the data sets so a different experience they also don't have access to all the super Uh, is the custom form working now? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that is a thing, and it is not there for aggregate. For you'll have to log in and try it. That's a, that's a nice thing. <laughs> JavaScript, <laughs> not the JavaScript. But... Yeah, because uh, most of the um, country implementation, because the complexities of the forms, really, what people love is that custom form. So you have to do whatever it takes. <laughs> <laughs> To so, make it work, yeah. So like I said, we're, we're really hoping to replicate all the functionality that you currently get with custom forms through configuration so that the user experience will still be the same. You'll still be able to do all the same things, but you won't build them the same way using this this custom JavaScript and HTML because it's just, it's just not safe. Um, so we've gotten that feedback a lot. Um, and then there's, you know, it'd be really good to get examples. So if you want to send examples of what you're trying to do with the JavaScript that, that we haven't been able to replicate yet, we can look at extensions and plugins. Yeah, that would be great. So plugins do work for data entry. And if you can do JavaScript, you can maybe do plugins for aggregate data entry. Yeah. Yeah. No, plugins do not work. Oh, we're working on that. That's that was that. <laughs> working on plugins in data entry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. So I think we can go ahead and wrap up this session, but I, I want to thank you all for joining and listening. Um, transition is hard. Change is hard. And we understand how, what a difficult position you are in um, to roll this, these new changes out. However, it was very much a needed change to create a long lasting system. So uh, through this process, we hope that we can, and some of the feedback you're giving us, we hope we can make it easier for you. But please reach out to us, uh, do some tags on JIRA, um, and thank you very much. <laughs>